Week nine, new product development. It's the highlights reel of the show. Some of the ideas around new product development are best dealt with in entrepreneurship subjects, and we've got a whole major around that. And we have an entrepreneurship support ecosystem here at the ANU. So let's talk about a couple of things to think about when we're dealing with new product development. The first is that inside marketing, new product development emerges from one of two paths. The first is the eureka moment of discovery. Someone comes up with a new idea, light bulb moment goes off, and there's a new product. The second and more likely prospect is the new product development emerges from a strategic decision. Now, in the Ansoft matrix, new products are two of the possible four choices. You think about the way in which we look at an overall growth strategy, it's either providing a new market for our products or a new product for our markets. So we look back at the growth options and even if we're looking at the exit strategies and we're going the whole GE finance matrix on it, growth through new product development, maintenance through perhaps maintaining a offering this product that we already do to an audience who hasn't received it before and that way they will see it as a new product or seeking out and creating replacement products as we're doing an exit strategy. Our second area that we tie back into is we tie back into the target consumer. Now we do this two ways. We do this as the consumer's needs and wants and as the market evolves, as times change, things may emerge that we can, you know, problems may emerge that people have solutions for. So market demand comes up. I mean, at the moment there's a big demand for survivalist products, air filter products, and the market is responding by creating a range of alternates, range of possible options. There's also the opportunity that arises from observing the consumer, discovering that they have a use innovation, they're doing something different with the product, observing it, tracking it, measuring it, then re-offering your value offer back out to the market with this new use innovation. Third category of interleave, interweave and overlap is coming back down to the marketing mix. How do we connect new product development back into the rest of the mix? Now for a large part of our thinking in new product development, we're going to obviously focus on the product theory. So your core actual and augmented product becomes the, a central focal point. So you can think about this from, do we add features? So do we modify the actual product by putting in features, putting in new components, elements, or artifacts? Or do we modify the product development by focusing on the core product and therefore creating more opportunities for value co-creation or finding co-created value than re-releasing the official version? Say for instance, uh, and one of the most common places this was coming from is cooking. The existence of the Mars bar in the confectionery aisle and the Mars bar in the cooking aisle is a use innovation that was just a change in packaging. The idea of the pre-chopped uh, products so again, we look at use innovations. How are people using our product? Can we offer versions of our product that enable that? So it's basically a little bit of features, sometimes packaging, to create a use innovation around value. But we can also go new product development through thinking, well, what happens if we change the distribution? What happens if we make it portable or mobile or remote or we go from a product that's delivered through a particular platform or medium. And one of the most obvious ones in this was the pizza, where we went, 
Yes, but what if it came to you? What if the pizza, instead of you coming to the pizza, the pizza comes to you? Home delivery created a new set of product categories. So just changing the distribution created a new product, a new value offer. Similarly, promotion, brands, imagery, we can create a new product, a new value offer through our use of promotion, through branding, through communication, through telling a story. Now, fundamentally for us as marketers for this semester, what's of importance to us is to look at new product development. To keep it simple, we'll probably keep it around the product goods category just to make it easier. But then we come to the question of why should we create new products? Why do this? First, best strategy. When we said we have a market, we've met all of that market's needs with, or we're meeting that market's needs, however their needs are changing. So we can try and retain them as customers and we just modify our product to suit. Alternatively, we can find that there is actually a new, we have a, an audience and they have new problems to solve. We already know a bit about that audience because we've got the market research on them, they're our regular customers, we understand them at certain levels, so we can create a product to meet their needs. And again, we're both, we're in the Ansoft matrix here again, an existing market, a new product. We may find that the development of a new technology has made it easier to make our products. The rise of the mobile phone to become the smartphone meant that an entire ecosystem of applications emerged because now we had a platform that could run small, tiny blocks of software in a little box in your hand. So a whole bunch of markets were created. We may look for second mover advantage, so we may be developing new products that are copycats or adaptations, or we ourselves may be subject to adaptations and copycats, so we're innovating our way out of our market share being consumed by the second mover advantage. Similarly, we may want to develop a new product as a means for solving a differentiation problem. We may have it from a straight up, we want to diversify the portfolio. We can no longer rely just on the one core offering. We need multiple offerings. There's always the fashion cycles. Things go in and out of trend, so we modify to stay on trend. And lastly, there's, we develop new products because we came up with a really cool idea. Music, art, novels, writers write because they've got ideas in their head that they need to get out of their heads. We develop new products because there are reasons of extrinsic nature, external influences, and there are reasons of intrinsic nature, internal influences. Sometimes you make a thing just because you need to get the, you've come up with the idea and you need to get it out of your head and into reality. So to this end, we need to also talk a little bit about what constitutes new. Now, a psychographic trait of the consumers is novelty seeking, which means that if you're a high novelty seeker, you need a lot of things that are new, but you also tolerate a lot of new things. The newest end of the spectrum that we could think of is the idea of the discontinuous innovation. This is also known as the really new product. It's also known as the disruptive product. Functionally, it's the version one, or realistically, it's probably the version 0 0.9. When it arrives on the market, it changes the market. So the reason it's known as disruptive is because it changes behaviors, it changes markets. It's not necessarily easy to describe. You quite often have to describe it as two or three different things. Like, it's a sewing kit that also has wiring and soldering and it's a, okay, doesn't necessarily work. 
Or you go out and say, okay, well, what if we took the mobile phone, what if we took the telephone that's on the wall, the TV set that's on the wall, an A4 piece of paper and the internet and combine the set together and we created the tablet. You can watch, a, you've got a screen that lets you watch TV anywhere around the world and read books as well. So you have to, the thing about a discontinuous innovation, what gives it away is that you have to describe it as a couple of different things because it's got no predecessor. There's no direct predecessor to this product that you can point back to and say, this is the newer, better version of it. Which leads us to dynamically continuous, or the quite new product. This is the version 2.0 something like it has existed previously, hence why dynamically continuous. There is still some continuity. What gives a dynamically continuous away is that you can find a predecessor, but also in order to use this new product, maybe your behavior has to change. Little things like the Apple removing the headphone jack from their mobile phones meant that we went from wired headphones to the earbuds, or in my case, I just stopped using my phone, stopped having headphones and using my phone for music. My behavior changed. The dynamically continuous product has a behavioral change component to it. In order to use this product, it's just new enough that you've got to learn something different or do something different. Roll down to the third category, and you are in continuous innovation. Now, the idea of a continuous innovation is that it's one in a sequence. It's just the next part along the path. You can draw a nice line back up the tree to the predecessors, right back to when it was a discontinuous. These are the version 2.1s. These are the version 3s. These are where it's an upgrade or an update. It doesn't change the behavior, it just does something better. It fixes something, or it's bigger, or faster, or has a better battery life. And as a marketer, the bulk of your life will be spent in continuous. That is also because this is the most useful form of innovation. A continuous innovation is about fixing a problem the previous version had. It's about integrating a new technology that makes it do what it's currently doing, creates that value offer, better, faster, stronger, quicker, lower impact, whatever it is. It does something better. So it's the upgrades and the updates. And there is a little bias in the marketing literature and the marketing field. We get super excited by discontinuous. We get kind of excited, but well, we don't show enough love for continuous. Making something in a better format. But also, continuous will fit where the value offer is modified by the change to the product. So if you're serving your product in a smaller can, bigger can, taller bottle, wider bottle, they're still drinking, dynamically continuous. But if you're changing the product in any way, shape, or form, it's continuous. Now, novelty as well is an important facet of when we get up to strategy and you do the strategy subject later, one of the concepts you might come across is this idea of new to us, new to the world. It's a nice little three by three matrixy out there. But the new to us is a risk. If you are looking at your product going, we've never made anything like this before, therefore it's new to the world, you haven't done your external analysis, market research, or due diligence. But also, just because something is new to us as an organization doesn't mean it's new to the audience. And this is perpetually one of the challenges that we face in teaching marketing is, to me, an object could be completely new, never dealt with it before, but it could be super familiar to you, and you're going to be sitting there going, 
he thinks that's new. Similarly, when you are creating something that is new to your audience, it might be old hat to you. You might be, in the Ansoft Matrix language, existing product to new audience. You take this existing product and you bring it to a new audience, it's new to that audience. You know all about it, but it's still innovation to, for them. So there's a bunch of thinking that you need to do around this by understanding that if it's new to you, then it's not necessarily new to the world. If it's new to your target market and not necessarily new to you, it's still an innovation for them. So a lot of our language around innovativeness needs to be thought of in terms of novelty to the target audience, novelty to the target market. Now in terms of creating a new product, there is a tried and tested pathway, ideas. Now, if you're having design thinking flashbacks, that's because some of the language they borrowed from us, we nicked from them, backwards and forwards. But it comes down to the simple thing of come up with the idea, prototype it, test it, refine it, or marketing is an experiment. Re make, test, release, evaluate, revisit, make, test, release, evaluate. Market tests. Now, I actually think Canberra is a test market for a wide range of products because on a routine basis, because I travel Australia quite a bit, I will find myself going to the shops to buy something I can get easily in Canberra and be looking around the place going, hey, where's my sort of, where's my product I've been buying for the last six months? Uh, so this also means that in terms of one of the challenges is finding a target market and a market segment that is reflective of a broader audience and is a good test bed for your market testing. Now, there's a little case study about this up in Queensland and Brisbane used to be a test market for technology until it was realized that Queenslanders will adopt anything with a three pin plug and try it and give it a go and they were artificially inflating the sales projections of a wide range of technologies because Queenslanders by and large were more innovative than the Victorian or the New South Wales markets. Melbourne is much more fashion focused and Sydney is much more status conscious than Brisbane. So Brisbane, chock filled with innovators who had low social uh, pride risk, like what do we care? Let's see what it does, were creating the impression that the larger two cities would follow suit. And also what was tending to happen is that if a technology got really big and super popular in Brisbane, it was getting almost rejected by default down in Melbourne because, hell, don't want to use something those Queenslanders use. God, they're so unfashionable. We'll stick with this 20 year old technology that we've never gotten past because all the new things got picked up elsewhere. So you've got to remember that your market test, your market launch and your product launch the segments that you use to market test should mirror the segment that you want to launch into. But you also have to be careful not to use, to create a scenario where the wider audience you want to address rejects your product because they don't see it for them as they've associated with a non-compatible target market. It's tough. On the other hand though, there are, from research, now this is from the Rogers 1995. Uh, Rogers' work is super influential in the innovation adoption uh, community. I wrote my thesis on the adoption of discontinuous innovations. So I'm super excited by new product developments. I spent a chunk of my life working this field these five traits are absolutely invaluable as a marketer trying to introduce a product to a customer. Now, the, their success story comes from 
a lot of research done around innovation. But functionally, this is almost uh, precisely the order in which, and the priority in which most people will consider whether a product fits their needs. So if you're getting someone who already has an existing solution, so there is an existing problem and you have an existing solution, your innovation needs to present a relative advantage to that market. This sounds obvious on the statement, but when you have invested so much of your life and time in creating this solution, you may fall into the trap of seeing an inherent merit in your way of solving the problem. Remembering that marketers don't believe in inherent merit, that there is nothing that exists that is inherently attractive to a market overall, everything exists in the context of an audience who will be the best fit for it. So relative advantage is showing that audience that the way that your value offer solves a problem or creates benefit does it better than what already is out there. And there are many, there is a lot of different ways you can get into relative advantage. It can be cheaper, faster, better, or it can be worse. You still have an edge in relative advantage. You can provide a service that is functionally worse than your rival and still win in the marketplace. Because the, what makes it worse makes it attractive. So we talk about things like uh, exercise. We talk about uh, case in point, CrossFit, Tough Mudder, endurance marathons, things that invoke pain in the individual through hardship and physical exertion have a relative advantage because they are worse and less efficient but the benefit people are seeking is the pain and the suffering and the mastery over that suffering. It's weird. Humans are like that. Second, so relative advantage. What do you do? What does your value offer do better than what else is out there? What is it makes it a better opportunity for someone to co-create their, uh, their value? Step two, or item two on this list, is compatibility. Now, compatibility is the idea of how well your product fits into what the consumer's life looks like. Compatibility is really interesting here because continuous products obviously have a bit of an advantage if they're already in the individual's life. But a continuous product has a challenge that a dynamically continuous product may get dropped because it stops being compatible. So I'll go back to my iPhone case in point is I still have the iPhone, but I've stopped using iTunes and I've stopped using it as a device for music because the headphone, the compatibility, I didn't up I don't like wireless devices. I didn't upgrade to a wireless set of headphones, earbuds, so I haven't bought into the new... There's a whole ecosystem of products that I was previously buying that I'm no longer buying because it didn't fit a compatibility. The new product failed on compatibility grounds. However, how the iPhone upgrade survived is that my entire library of software, my quite heavily invested in back catalog of apps were compatible, therefore it was worth me staying inside this ecosystem. Compatibility slides into a whole bunch of different places, uh, but if you think about this in terms of this sits closer uh, to price than it does anywhere else, what is the effort cost of engaging this new product into your lifestyle? Item three on the list, observability. Now, the observability can be high and beneficial and low and beneficial. 
there is not, there's no clean solution to observability. For some people, being seen to be using the product is the feature that they want. So these are your early adopters, these are your opinion leaders, these are the people for whom when the Apple iPods first came out, those big white ear buds and their big white cable, and what we refer to as the mug me look, they wanted the signaling. They wanted the social signaling that says, I have an iPod. So observability was a really big thing. Brands that you wear proudly, the fact that people walk around the place in branded t-shirts for products that aren't t-shirts, observability, really important. It allows for in-group and out-group. It allows for group alignment, group orientation, the projection of the ideal self. There's a whole lot of benefits. Also, observability allows for social transmission of the idea. If you have a product that's high visible and the influencers are walking around the place wearing it, then you can copy the influencers' look and you can be part of the inner team. You can be joining the, that inner circle. There are some reverse sides to it, is the more observable it is, sometimes that leads to the failing of the product. The Google heads-up display, the Google glasses, highly observable and everyone thought you were a jerk for wearing it. Um, high observability and negative trait and negative connotations about the product sink it really quickly. But observability is also a question of compatibility. Are you looking for something that is high visible because your life has high visible objects? Are you looking for something that is discreet and subtle because you're not much for the display? Fourth up, complexity. Now, there is a bias in a lot of marketing literature towards trying to create simplicity. Complexity is a feature that is attractive to certain markets and a disincentive to others. The existence there's a whole genre of video games that are ridiculously hard to play. Dark Souls is high in there. Uh, all those sideways scrolling beat em up games that require you to precisely hit a sequence of 32 patterns absolutely on time. Those are features and people love them. And to complexity, do not mistake simplicity for greater benefit and complexity for greater cost. Understand your target market. Is complexity something they value? Because quite often in dynamic continuous behaviors, we reduce the complexity of a product offering, assuming that simplicity is what the market wants. Now, and sometimes that actually is what the market wants. The mass market wants a very basic, easy to use, start button here, stop button there. I don't want any other options. But the early adopter and the innovator wanted complexity. They wanted to be able to show mastery. They wanted to be able to use a product that was highly visible to be very complicated to show that they're clever. And they're smarter than they are. they're smarter than those sheeple and the pack and the mob and the. Tr okay, the thing is, the more complex something is, the harder it is to use. If complexity and mastery of objects and locus of control, and the need to exert control over your environment, are features of your target segment, then high complexity is highly compatible and it's an advantage for the product. The early, the success of the rollout of computers, uh, desktop computers, IBM was beating Apple because IBMs were harder to use. Windows was a less intuitive, harder to use interface, so people with high need for mastery, high need to display their ability to control their environment, went with the it doesn't work and it takes a lot of effort to make it work product because it had greater compatibility, lifestyle compatibility, and it gave them an advantage of looking smarter. So complexity, 
if it's difficult to unlock the value and there's no value in the difficulty, then you've got a problem. But never, never sell off complexity if that's what your audience wants. As I said, that there is a market for competitive language skills. Scrabble. Here, here is a random set of letters. Recall something from the dictionary that gives you the highest point score. It's dictionary recall with maths. And maths with multiplication as well. Triple word score, double word score. There's maths multiplication and randomization. If you step back and look at the diction, let's play the dictionary game. I'll give you some random things. You build something from the dictionary. It's quite complex. And there's a sport, there are sports based around it. I've got a friend who's a competitive Scrabble player. She has traveled internationally to compete in Scrabble tournaments. She's also traveled internationally to compete in crossword tournaments because it's a similar skill set. I think she was a Sudoku, uh, a competitive league Sudoku player as well. Complexity sells, complexity has value. Trialability. Okay, this is an important one. The easier it is for someone to give it a go and walk away, the more likely it is they are to try because you can reach a wider range of markets who have basically its trialability is all about price. Is it cheap, quick? Is it time, effort, or energy quick to give it a go? So trial, trialability is really a, an important aspect when we look at the first four having been met, trialability takes us into the consumer behavior decision-making process where we go behavioral intention, do I intend to do this? Can I give it a go, trialability? Do I have to fully commit all in? So that's what you're looking at here. How, to what extent can your new product be tested before being adopted so people can see what the relative advantage is how it fits, what's it look like, and how difficult or easy is it to use, and what value they're getting out of the difficulty or the ease of use. So quickly drawing back into the theory before linking back out to one more segment. Those five variables that we just talked about can be used for market segmentation. Consumer behavior helps you link in an understanding around compatibility for lifestyle, decision-making outcome, you think about the consumer behavior framework, how we go from information search, from recognition of problem, to information search, to possible different solutions, then your outcomes are, one of the outcomes is trial. So if you own a new product and you can make it trialable, then you've got, you fit into that framework. And lastly, market research. Observability of an innovation increases the degree to which you can use certain qualitative research techniques to see how it's being used, if it's being used, but also the extent to which people are going to be comfortable about being seen applying the product. So there are some cross wires back out now. You've seen that the, the Rogers 5, how they wire back out. We also have in innovation adoption theory, we have a set of default market segments we think about. So this is a segmentation strategy and this is our distribution of the people through the market segments. Each market segment comes with a keyword or key idea. First, innovators. It's a very small percentage of the market, 2.5%. Novelty and newness, that's their driver. They need things to be new. They're interested in how does it work, what can I do with it? Their focus is much more around trying than it is around necessarily succeeding. So they also have a high tolerance for risk. They've got a resource base that can afford to make multiple product uh, mistakes, they can afford to buy something, go, nah, didn't work, and move on to try something else new. 
But as soon as the novelty wears off, as soon as the shininess wears off, or something else new comes in the market, they're off. Your second category we talk about, we talk about the early adopters. Now this group of people are influencers, they're opinion leaders, they're fashion leaders, but what they need is they need that new, they need the new thing to set themselves apart from the rest of the pack. Because the rest of the pack look to the early adopters for leadership. So early adopters need to be able to differentiate, but they are also by nature leaders, and leaders only exist if there are followers. Which brings us to the early majority. And I like the early majority and late majority. I want to say here and now, we live and die by the extent to which we can reach out and get the early and late majority on board. My research was around innovators. They're kind of nifty. They'll bring back some of your costs. Early adopters, I find them fascinating but irritating. Uh, the idea that you would forego something that was of personal use to you because it was out of fashion or other people were using it, uh, I, don't, I don't get it. It's not my thing. So I honestly sit either in the innovative, innovator camp going, ooh, shiny, give that a go, or early majority. I, I tend not to spend a lot of time being an early adopter. Which the other thing I should probably point out about this model is you are not uniquely one of these. You are contextually in one of these audience segments. For each innovation, for each product category, you are going to have one of these areas you're most likely to operate in. For the bulk of us, for the bulk of our lives, we're going to sit somewhere around here, somewhere around early majority to late majority, or we're going to be in the laggards. Periodically, in a certain product class, we will be up at innovators, or we will be up at early adopters. But we're not, it's not a universal trait. You don't suddenly get branded a little stamp, huh? Welcome to the 2.5%, you're an innovator. You're stuck there for life, sunshine. God, being stuck as an innovator for life would be hell. You never get to get the good version of the product. You only ever get to beta test. But back to the early majority where most of us operate. At this point, you are picking up the product because other people have bought it. And you can see that it's got validity, it's got compatibility, it's got value. Maybe someone who's influential in your community has done this. Maybe someone whose opinions that you seek out. So either an information leader, an opinion leader, an influencer, someone whose work you watch. You've gone, you've seen, and you've gone, yep, I want, I want a bit of that. So you've copied. And that's a good thing. It's a brilliant way of doing things. You've drawn down your information search from external sources, the validation of peers, it's peer reviewed, it's evidence led, it's a great way of doing things. It's a really smart way to think. Late majority. Now the late majority is interesting because early majority looks for the endorsement of leaders. Late majority is about, sometimes it's, oh, well, guess I have to, everyone else is. But other times it's, this idea is sufficiently widespread that it's low risk. It's probably available in a dozen different flavors and co colors and shapes and sizes. At late majority, coming in and adopting at late majority is also where you've got the best set of options at your disposal. At the Innovator Camp, there's one version of it, and it's just the newly released one. By early adopters, there's three, maybe five versions of it, and maybe it's on version 2.0. Early majority, it's just started to come out to mainstream, so there's a good version of it. There's still some dodgy versions, but there's, there's a few different choices. By late majority, most of the bugs have been worn out of the system. It's probably operating at its peak performance. It's as best a version of the product as you're going to get for a while, and you're in a good position. So quite often, the late majority coming in after a huge chunk of the audience has been involved, you've got the most number of people who can explain how it works. 
you've got the most number of manuals and instructions and support, it's actually not a disadvantage to come in late. The only reason you call the late majority is simply the time from the point of adoption. You're also the back end. After the late majority has come in, that's it. They're the last of the adopters. The laggard class are people who reject the offer. And there are dozens of different reasons to reject an offer. Laggards are often criticized in the literature. The marketing community makes quite some derogatory statements about laggards. But functionally, a laggard is someone who says no. And no is a sentence in and of itself, and no should be respected and will be respected. They say no, you didn't offer them something of value. So functionally, the laggard does not value your offer. The laggard does not adopt your offer. For whatever reason, they don't value it. They don't value it. They've said no. That's it. There's, there's no argument, but there can be, wait, hey, what if we made a better value offer? So some of the times, there's a category inside the laggard that's referred to as the super adopter. And with mobile phones, and particularly the iPhone, I didn't get on board until version 4 because I was sitting here in the laggard super adopter class going, I picked up version 1 of an iPhone, looked at it and went, this isn't ready yet. Having been an innovator, having bought Palm Pilots, having bought new technologies that eventually faded out, uh, I had the BlackBerry, I had the Nokia, I had the Palm Pilot. I had some cutting edge stuff for the mobile phone market. But when the iPhone came out, I picked it up, looked at it and went, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not buying this. I'm not buying this for a couple more generations. And I've done this with the PlayStation. I was on board for the PlayStation 1, went, you're OK. And I've come back on board for the PlayStation 4. I've done the same on a range of platforms where I've gone either from experience of being the innovator gone, yeah, this is about five to 10 years away from being ready, or this is three to four versions away from being ready, so I'll come back in later. Which would, as someone who picks up new technology quite quickly, I quite often camp down here in the laggard class because I've eyed up the new technology and gone, it's novel, it's new, but it doesn't have a relative advantage. I'm going to wait until the relative advantage shows up. So for a few generations of the product, I sit there, then suddenly, bang, I'm back there. Again, context is how this works is a market segment as a way to see the world and also a way to see how, if you look around this, when we start getting to combining new product development, you start moving into strategy around this, you start seeing how these concepts interweave with each other. So the final thing on the, the list is just starting to look at how that crossover between the innovator, the early adopter, the early majority, and the late majority. Laggards are left off this for the obvious reason. They don't adopt. Just that laggard column just says no. So for an innovator, the relative advantage is the shininess, the new. For the early adopter, the relative advantage is the differentiation. This lets me set myself apart from the pack. And that relative advantage gets destroyed by the actions of the early majority because they copy. Therefore, they can no longer, the early adopters can no longer distinguish themselves. So this is why there's also, when we talk about things like reasons to develop new products, is that these two categories are churning. They, they're off to find something else that's shiny. They're off to find something else that distinguishes them. They're off to copy. Then they're like, cool, the early adopters are doing something new. We should copy that. Meanwhile, the late majority is sitting there going, what's everyone else up to? Because that's what makes it valuable to them. At the point in time that everyone else is on board, it's like, oh, well, this is fashionable. I'm in. So that's their relative advantage. There's no social risk to it.
So again, with all these things, what you're looking for is to be able to wire together multiple possible ways of seeing the world. This is the complexity of marketing. We have a number of ways that we can view the world and you look for the one that gives you the best fit and the best category and the best resource to help you make your decision to help you support the strategy that you want to implement through the right set of tactics. Because if you go to an innovator group and say, everyone else is doing this, the innovators are going to walk off. But you go to the early majority group and say, you'll be the first, you'll lead, they're going to walk away. So you've got to know what your market's at and know what they need and what the relative advantage is for them and work with it, build on the back of it help them get the value that they're looking for from the market. So, new product development. There's, it is in, a, in and of itself uh, a means to an end. It sits within the strategy and tactics framework. It draws heavily on consumer behavior, on product theory, but it also gives you the opportunity to engage in other aspects of the marketing mix. And it's fed into by things like the external, the pestle analysis, information from that that you were gathering to understand the environment can help you see opportunities for new product development. So remember, marketing's heavily cross-wired. Look for those opportunities to cross over and integrate the frameworks and the concepts and work with, remember that all the data you generate is knowledge and the framework upon which you can base future decisions. So when you're doing new product development, you'll iterate, reiterate, do multiple drafts, trial and error. The whole marketing, all marketing is an experiment approach. Everything you learn from that helps you move your product into the market, helps you position it for its relative advantage, helps you find those market segments and what's their advantage for them. And that's how marketing works as an interconnected, cross-wired, heavily cyclical, but ultimately compatible system.